Now, the Buckeye Extra Podcast with Rob Aller, Bill Rabinowitz, and Joey Kaufman from the Columbus Dispatch. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Buckeye Extra Football Podcast. This is a special week, Indiana. We don't often say that it's a special week when Ohio State plays Indiana, but this is this is a first. Top five matchup for the Hoosiers against the Buckeyes, Ohio State's number two, Indiana number five. Joined by Zach Osterman from the Indianapolis Star, has covered the Hoosiers, both football and basketball. And usually this time of year, you're kind of transitioning to basketball, right? Not this year so yeah. much. No, not really. Yeah. I mean, they're in, they're in the Bahamas next week, and I'll be down there, and I'll probably miss the bucket game. And, you know, it, it might wind up being the most impactful bucket game in uh, program history, or at least in 67, when they won and went to the Rose Bowl. So, you know, who knew going to the Bahamas for basketball was going to Knock out the football coverage. Well, thanks for doing this, Zach. Um, I, I'll start with the the obvious one. Did you have any idea this was coming this season? You know, I, I um, I've said this to obviously a lot of people in the last few weeks. I picked them to win eight games in the regular season. I actually wanted to pick them to win nine. And a an unnamed uh, former IU beat writer who can best be described as grizzled and cynical um, talked me out of it based on you know just generally Indiana's. Uh, you know, history in football. So I, I went with eight and I think I just threw them the, uh, I think I threw them the bowl game to get to nine wins, which was, uh, uh, what's, was at the time the most Indiana had ever won in a single season, um, which is a long winded way of saying, I thought they'd be good. I, I thought, you know, the schedule shaped up nicely. I thought Kurt Signetti's background, his track record, you know, the, the, just the total number of assistants he brought with him from James Madison the work Indiana did in the portal, I thought they'd have a chance to be a bowl team, maybe a winning record. Um, you know, obviously I didn't see this. I don't think anybody saw this. And and not just, it's not just obviously 10-0, and 0, it's the way Indiana's been doing it. You know, when uh, Ward Manuel got the question Tuesday night about why BYU dropped eight spots after losing to Kansas, he said it more diplomatically than this. But he said, basically, you know, they've got some good wins, but they've also kind of been scraping by, you know, in some of these games against Utah, against Oklahoma State, and now they lose to Kansas. You know, Indiana has not been scraping by. The Michigan game aside, they have just kind of been blowing teams out. You know, the, the um, before the Michigan game, their thinnest margin of victory was 14 points. Um, and one of those games was a game played in a hurricane against Maryland. The other one was the Washington game when they didn't have Curtis Rourke. So, you know, when they've been in relatively normal conditions and at relatively full strength, they have been a dominant team. And that is what I think has caught us all so much on the hop has been not necessarily that Indiana turned out to be good in Kurt Signetti's first season. It's it's how good and it's how comprehensively they've been winning some of these football games. You think Kurt Signetti is surprised by what's happened? I mean, he himself has said, like, you can't expect to go 10-0 and in year one, you know, and and I think he's a, obviously he's a, a, I think anybody who's ever listened to him speak knows he's a pretty confident guy. Um, he's not afraid to speak his mind, you know, and and, and I, I'm not talking just about like the, the, you know, probably Ohio State fans know about the quote at the, when he was on the microphone at the basketball game, but he's not afraid to, you know, just kind of say stuff that, that, I mean, after they beat Nebraska, he said, well, this was supposed to be a good team supposed to give us a test. You know, I guess we passed the test. Um, he's not afraid to be, you know, a little bit dry with his sense of humor. Uh, but even he, I think, has acknowledged, you know, this is this is abnormal. Like this is, you know, kind of on the the extreme end of what anybody could have expected. But again, it's 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 not like Indiana has been winning and living kind of on the margins or, or on the razor's edge. I mean, you know, it, it Michigan was probably the first time that in fact, it really was the first time that we were deep into the fourth quarter and wondering if Indiana might lose the game. The only other one that's been remotely that close is Northwestern, where I think it was early fourth quarter Northwestern, I think it was down 10 and scored a touchdown to get it to three. And then Indiana just punched off two scores and walked out with a 17 point win. So, um, you know, it's, it's like even Kurt Zignetti, yes, I think is surprised, but again, I don't think it, it, it takes away from the extent to which Indiana has earned its way here. What's, what's he like to cover? I mean, he's interesting. He's, you know, he's, he's not quite the, I think the quote machine that people think he is. And, and this is, that's always the way with coaches, right? Like if you don't, if you don't pay attention to everything a coach says as a fan or as a reporter, who's got to be at the, the press conferences and, and everything, you'll see the four or five times they say something kind of goofy. Um, and, and you'll think, Oh, you know, that's, that's just Kurt Signetti or whoever. 
Um, I don't, he hasn't been nearly kind of as all about it in the season. I think in season, he's much more like he learned from Nick Saban. And I think he's very Saban-esque in his process of just, you know, the, 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 the next thing is the most important thing. And really, I think is one of his great strengths as a coach. And I don't know how you measure this, but you and I have covered enough sports to know it when you see it is that ability, not just for him to maintain kind of like intense focus just on the task at hand and, and not get distracted, but also to get that into his team. And Indiana, you know, as, as a team just does not seem distracted or affected by any of this. And I don't know, maybe it'll overcome them, but I, I think we're at a point in the season where if it was going to, it would have already. And I think a lot of that comes from Kurt Signetti. Again, he's, you know, he has a little bit of Spurrier in him. I grew up down South. We all, we all love the old ball coach and, uh, you know, the stuff he used to say about Georgia players getting arrested or, you know, all the books that weren't colored in the Auburn library when it caught fire. But he's not quite at that level. He will throw that in once in a while. But I think this time of year, he tends to just kind of be all business. Um, but he is, you know, I, I joke with people. Uh, I've, I've, I've made this joke. It's not actually really a joke. Uh, the phrase talking ball has seen about a, a 2000 percent increase in usage in the North end zone facility in the last 11 months, he really is just a football coach. Like he's happiest when he's just sitting there watching film, thinking up new stuff to do on a football field. And yeah. ultimately, I guess to some extent it shows on Saturday. What do you think has made him so successful? I mean, you know, the famous quote is, I, I you know, Google me, I win. Um, and he has, uh, what do you think makes him so successful? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I, I'm not going to pretend I tracked his career, you know, going back to Elon or Indiana PA. I think, obviously, he's been with some good coaches, and that's that's part of it. He's been exposed to some really good players. Um, he comes from a coaching family, and I'm sure that, you know, I'm sure his dad and, and his brother have had influences on him as well. I think for Indiana specifically, like when they went into the search process, one of their sort of non-negotiables was – a coach with a significant track record um, running his own program and having success. And obviously, you know, you, you, you can't say, oh, well, we're just going to go get, you know, Kirby Smart because he's run his own program forever. But one of the things that it, that sort of attracted them to Signetti very early on was just the fact that wherever he'd been, he'd been successful. And most of the time, you know, I, I don't I don't know enough about the dynamics of Division II football to know about kind of the, the other Indiana he coached at. But like, you know, my parents went to Georgia Southern. You know, that Elon job is, is probably one of the worst in the FCS. And he goes there and he wins immediately. But the only time he's really been in a job where you would say he had a lot of the natural advantages would have been when JMU was, when he took JMU in the FCS. And he was with them, you know, for three years there. And that's that was obviously one of the big programs down at that level. But even bringing him up to, to the FBS, people thought he was going to struggle. You know, he kind of had to readopt sort of that underdog approach. And he himself said when he took the IU job, he said, you know, I've, I feel like I've kind of done this job before. I feel like I know how to go to a place like this. I think that appeals to him. I think that is maybe a little bit of kind of what animates him as a coach, that it's not just winning and losing. It's the challenge of going to a place that maybe requires him to be a little bit more creative to 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 sort of pull together something that wasn't there before. And then when you see his methods, again, I, I don't I mean, you and I both. We work in a in an industry that abhors cliches, but there's a reason why some of them endure. Um, his players really do just play really disciplined, physical, smart, clean, details oriented football. And when you see a team that is that is that good across the board at that, you have to think that comes from the coach. And so, um, you know, whatever it is about his his methods, his approach you know, his, his, uh, whatever other cliche words we want to use, mindset, mantra, yada, yada. Someone used the word ethos in a press <laughs> conference earlier this yeah. year. Um, it's clear that it gets, it's clear that he understands what about his process gets results and how to, how to go about it. Like the, if there's an example that I would give that maybe is just kind of an illustration of it, they had a quarterback last year at Jamie named Jordan McLeod. He had a really, really good year. He was Sunbelt Offensive Player of the Year. We all assumed when Signetti came over, he'd just bring Jordan McLeod with him. I don't think he ever even really considered bringing McLeod in. And I looked McLeod's stats up the other day. He's got like 25 touchdowns and eight picks at Texas State. He's having a good year. It's not like he's a bad quarterback or he was only a function of that system. But there was something in Kurt Signetti's process that said, Jordan McLeod was the right quarterback for me there, but I need something different if I'm going up to the Big Ten. And I think that's, I think that's, 
evidence of a coach that is that that really has a very firm grasp of, of his process, why it works, and how to make it work. Well, I think Indiana did a very smart thing and one that colleges don't do very often. So often, colleges want the hot young coach, coordinator, you know, first year, second year, you know, the hot coach. And Indiana went the opposite way and said, you know, like you said, we want somebody who's established. And and the fact of the matter is, let's say Indiana hired a 40-year-old hotshot. If he was, if he had this kind of year, he'd probably be courted by the Ohio States of the world. You know, I'm not the Ohio States of the market right now, but, but you know, I mean, that, that's, you know, Kurt Sleek is 63. They gave him an eight-year contract. I mean, I'm not saying he couldn't leave. I mean, that's really he could. But, you know, he could be there for the rest of, of his career. And, and, you know, if he, if they hired a, 40 year old, what are the odds that they would keep him for an eight year contract? Pretty, pretty slim if he had success. Um, so I think Indiana was really smart in what they did because, you know, it's, especially for an athletic director, the, you want to make a splash and hire the, the hot young thing. And they went with the established thing and it's obviously paid off. I mean, it's a brilliant hire. Um, let me, let me start with, you mentioned the quarterback, um, that they didn't take. Let's talk about the one that they, they do have, uh, Curtis Work. Ohio University um, had a good career there. What what has made him so successful at IU? I think there's there's a handful of things. I mean, first of all, like this is the third straight year Signetti's had um, a, a transfer quarterback, and again, it's you don't want to get obsessive about like what you know. Oh, it's all about you know just the coach or whatever. Um, but it's clear that between him, Tino Sanceri, his quarterbacks coach, and Mike Shanahan. Who's his, his offensive coordinator? Sincere is now his co-offensive coordinator. Shanahan calls plays. It's clear that they have like a good process, right? For for taking a um, for taking a, a transfer quarterback and putting him in positions to succeed. What I will say is like part of it is that Rourke can make a lot of different kinds of throws. Indiana, it is a passing offense. Um, I've said this a lot too. When when Rourke was out with a thumb injury, Indiana was playing Washington. Washington had been struggling to stop the run. We all kind of assumed Indiana's not like a prolific running team, but they're pretty effective at it. They'll just run the ball. They'll make it easy on Taven Jackson. And eventually they did. But in the first half, like the f- five of the first seven offensive snaps were throws. You know, it is, Signetti himself says it is a passing offense. You know, he said, I, he, he found him saying, I used to run the ball a lot. I don't anymore. That's not what we do anymore. And Rourke can make just about all the throws that the offense asks him to, the back shoulder stuff. You know, he's really good throwing under pressure, um, you know, screens and swings, RPOs, timing routes. Indiana does a lot of one read stuff with him, slants, crosses, you know, digs, like just stuff that's that's just sort of like snap, drop, throw, snap, drop, throw. And that gets him in a rhythm. And the other thing I, I would say about Rourke is he is incredibly efficient. I, I pulled up the numbers while we were talking. You know, he is, um, I think, second or no, he's fourth now, excuse me, in the conference in passing yards per game. But he averages five and a half attempts fewer than the next closest than anybody else above him. Dylan Gabriel averages 31.9 attempts per game. Rourke only averages 26.4. If you look at the guys at the top of the list, like Billy Edwards has thrown the ball 41 times a game. Rourke doesn't need to throw it that much to be efficient. He's got 21 touchdowns to just four interceptions. He has uh, the best quarterback rating in the conference, according to CFP stats, just ahead of Will Howard. And he's the only quarterback in the conference and at the moment, anyway, averaging 10 yards per attempt. Yeah. So like he is incredibly efficient in the way that he throws. And um, this is true of Indiana more widely, but like, if you look at his numbers on third downs, they are ahead of, they're well ahead of the national average. If you look at his numbers in the red zone, Indiana's, you know, arguably the most prolific red zone offense in the country. They're certainly the most prolific red zone offense in the big 10. He's really, really good there, which is difficult sometimes, obviously when the field gets compressed and it's, a little bit harder to throw, you know, against, uh, I think it was UCLA earlier in the season. I think he was nine of nine on third downs for 120 something yards. Like he just, he is an incredibly efficient quarterback. Now he's had since coming back from the thumb surgery, you know, there have been moments when maybe you felt like that wasn't quite the Curtis work we were seeing earlier in the season. I think one of the questions about Indiana getting this second bye week is, has he healed up even more from that? Because he, he looked better you know, kind of, again, he looked better in the second half against Michigan State than the first half. He looked better in the first half against Michigan than he did against Michigan State. And then everything just kind of got untracked in the second half offensively in general. Is he has he gone up another level in terms of his comfort and, and maybe his, his feel and his health and that, that thumb in his throwing hand? I think that's a big question for this game. But he has been really efficient 
when you know with, with everything Indiana has asked mm-hmm. him to do. The only close game Indiana's had is the Michigan game, and I didn't see the first half. I did see the second half. Um, it kind of felt like – I said this on your podcast. It kind of felt like Indiana kind of realized, oh, my God, we're playing Michigan, um, and we're we really going to beat Michigan. And they barely held on. And that that brought back all the talk about is Indiana really a product of their schedule as much as their their success? Um or just the, you know the way they played, and you know, I think it's mostly been Indiana has been legitimately good, but that did give me pause. Again, I didn't see the first half in which Indiana played well. I saw the second half in which they just couldn't really do anything on on offense and just held on. I mean, if they played a fifth quarter, I'm not sure they would have held on. Um, but that was that was kind of an eye opener for me. Uh, how much concern is there among IU fans that maybe okay we're stepping up in class here and are we ready for this? I think that is, I mean, that is the question that I think needs answered out of the Michigan game. I think, you know, some of what happened against Michigan, you know, Rourke actually threw, it was his fourth interception of the season on the first offensive snap for the second half. And Michigan kind of had a couple of drives there in the third quarter where they didn't really go anywhere, but they just converted a lot of third and short, a couple, you know, one or two fourth and shorts. So the drives just took a long time. Indiana's offense wasn't on the field. By the time they got back on the field, you felt like they lost some of that rhythm they had in the first half when they, like they scored 17 points and some like 225, 230 yards of total offense. So if they literally just sort of like replicated that in the second half, we would have looked at that probably as this is another one of those dominant Indiana performances. Look what they did. I do think a couple things about that Michigan game that 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 should give Indiana fans pause. And I, I, I said this on, on our podcast with you um, was number one, that's maybe the first time Indiana saw a team with a pronounced advantage in depth and, and, you know, when, when Michigan went from its ones to its twos, the drop off wasn't so great. And, you know, maybe the the pass rush was still difficult or you couldn't pick on, uh, you know, the nickel corner in quite the same way. And Indiana, listen, Indiana also had a couple drops. Elijah Surratt had a couple drops that that he's not doesn't normally make. And maybe that speaks to a little bit of what you talked about of of suddenly the, the, you know, the stage being just a little bit, you know, the, the spotlight being a little bit brighter. Um, but I'd also say, you know, that was, I mean, I think Ohio State's defense is a lot better. I wouldn't be shocked if Michigan's front four is is the best one Indiana's going to see this year, and they had a devil of a time blocking it in the second half. I mean, that is as, as, as much as they have struggled to keep Rourke upright and clean in his pocket all year. And that is kind of maybe if, if you're asking about these bye week questions, the biggest one to me is, is that a problem Indiana can't solve that when they go up that athletic level, the offensive line has just kind of reached its ceiling or were there things that maybe they could do to clean up with a little bit, you know, cause I know Ohio state just lost its starting center to an Achilles injury. Indiana lost its left guard to an Achilles injury at the very end of Michigan week. They had to reshuffle their offensive line a little bit, you know, maybe was there, you know, some of that, new faces and, and moving some pieces around is stuff a little bit sharper when you have two weeks to prepare for Ohio state and everybody's kind of, everybody knows what's going on and knows the score. I think that's one of the big questions for Indiana this weekend in this matchup is basically how much of that trouble Indiana had with Michigan's you know, pass rush front four line of scrimmage defensively can't be fixed and how much of it could be fixed or cleaned up during the bubble. Right. Um, let's talk about Indiana's defense. Well, actually, I'm going to back up. How many transfers do they have? Does Indiana have? And how oh, many teams matter? I mean, it's it's somewhere. I mean, they turned over more than I forget what exactly what the um, I forget ex- what the exact number is. It was in I think the high 30s. They turned over more than half their countable scholarships. Now they did bring in quite a number of freshmen. They retained a decent chunk of the class that Tom Allen staff had put together. Then added a few more some JMU guys. You know, some guys like they picked up a four-star QB who, you know, in all likelihood won't play in this game because he's young, but at a center grove who was a victim of the, uh, the the coaching change at Duke. So, you know, some of it is high school guys, but, I mean, it's it's 13 JMU transfers. Obviously, the quarterback's a transfer. Uh, by Saturday, they'll be starting, I guess, two transfers on the offensive line. All four, that they, they completely remade their running back room. Tight ends a transfer. Probably two wide receivers starting will be transfers, although they, they are – like they've got five or six at wide receiver, and they will run them in and out. You know, Surratt's the best one. Cooper's probably second best. Maybe Keyshawn Williams third. But, like, they will rotate them a ton. On defense, it's transfers all over the place. Both corners are transfers. 
I guess one was in the one was one transferred in before last season, but they're both still transfers. One of the safeties is a trans. No, this, I, I'm doing the math in my head. Two safeties are transfers. Both linebackers are transfers. Um, three of your four starting linemen transferred in after the coaching change. The fifth one was another transfer held over from, I think, the last offseason Tom Allen was in town. So the point is, I mean, it is very much a portal team. And a lot of that has been done by Signetti and his staff. There's obviously the JMU guys. They've obviously they've also had success, you know, going and getting Justice Ellis and Keyshawn Williams from Wake Forest, Curtis Rohr, um, a couple safeties transferred in from Old Dominion who've been really, really good, Sean Asbury and Terry Jones. So it's not just been the JMU guys, but it is a transfer heavy team for sure. Let's talk about the defense. Um, you know, lights out pretty much, right? I mean, you know, I mean they've given up some points and yards. It's not not Ohio State's defense, but it's been a very good defense. What's been the key to it? Yeah, I mean, honestly, like this defense is has kind of, I think, unfairly lived in the shadow of its offense of, you know, all season. I mean, like they are third in the conference behind Ohio State and Penn State in scoring defense. They're allowing less than two touchdowns a game. Um, you know, they're they're seventh in the conference and or excuse me, no, that's passing defense. I'm looking for total defense. Sorry, I'm just on air admin. They're second in the conference behind Ohio State in yards allowed per game total. Um, but I mean, it's it's worth saying that's like 4.3 more yards a game. They are first in the conference in yards per play allowed. Um, and that has probably, like, when you talk about like, surprises within the team, I think we all thought Indiana would be good offensively. That's Signetti's background. He brought four offensive assistants with him from JMU. Obviously, Curtis Rourke's resume looked really good. They brought in a bunch of, you know, good skill guys from JMU and Wake Forest. They added a tackle from Wisconsin. We just thought, like, Signetti's offenses have kind of always moved and scored the ball wherever they've been. They didn't get quite as much quantity on defense, and they had to wait until the spring window to add a couple guys who've wound up being really important. D'Angelo Pons was, like, the last of those JMU transfers. He was a freshman All-American last year at JMU. He was Indiana's best corner. Um, and then C.J. West, who was a defensive tackle from Kent State, um, who had kind of a maybe a quiet start to the season, maybe unsurprising catching up, didn't have spring camp, but has been really good, like really good for about the last month. And it's been the defense, the dominance, um, just how, like, fundamentally sound it's been. You know, I mean, I've covered Indiana defenses that maybe could get after the quarterback for some mistakes capitalized on some turnovers, but but not ones that were this sound against the run, uh, not ones that could rush the passer so effectively with just four down linemen. They don't blitz much because they don't have to. Maybe they will a little bit more in this game, but obviously Ohio State, you know, I think Indiana might look at Ohio State's offensive line and feel like there's some things they can take advantage of there, especially now with another injury. Um, they have been, you know, whether you're talking like run stuff, whether you're talking pass rush, uh, they lead the conference in sacks and tackles for loss. I believe they lead the conference in um, in quarterback pressures. If you look at the PFF numbers, they're first in the conference in both yards per rush allowed and rushing yards per game allowed. Like it's everybody kind of want to talk about the offense because Indiana was hanging these big numbers. You know, forty two against Maryland, forty two against UCLA, fifty six against Nebraska. The defense is really, really good. And if if anything, I know Michigan's nothing special um, offensively this year, certainly. But if if you know if if that Michigan game meant anything in particular for Indiana, I think it's probably Indiana's defense because they got put in some really bad field position situations in that second half. And the only touchdown Michigan scored the entire game. They they needed they needed four downs from like the six to finally punch it in on fourth and fourth and one or goal from the one. Indiana's defense just did not allow them any room to breathe. And um, it's been like that most of the year, not the entire year. Maryland had success throwing against this team. And I think that's maybe a game that Ohio State might point to in in film and in prep and say, you know, this team is vulnerable in some ways. Um, But in the aggregate, this team has been really, really good defensively. And if you ask me why I think Indiana has a shot in this game, it's it's really more the defense and the idea that I think Indiana – will probably give up some points, but might have the opportunity to make some plays, get Ohio State off the field, maybe get into some favorable field position situations for its offense um, in a way that, you know, Indiana's probably played Ohio State in the past well because it's had good offenses. But I think this this game, if Indiana does compete, is going to be in part because Indiana's got a really good defense. Who's their best player, do you think, on defense? Uh, it's Mikel Kamara. I mean, he's like, I would I would make an argument, and I don't say this lightly, 
I would make an argument. He's Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year. I think he's certainly in that conversation. Um, he leads the conference in sacks. I think he's second behind Abdul Carter. He is in tackles for loss. Um, he's an end. They will line him up as a tackle sometimes. They'll do some unbalanced fronts and things like that. He and West work really, really well together. They run some twists, some stunts, you know, some sort of block down and come in behind stuff. Um, because West is just kind of a classic nose tackle, and Kamara plays really well off of him. Um, he's forced a couple fumbles. I mean, he is like I said, I, I would, you know, I, I think he might still lead the nation in quarterback pressures, according to Pro Football Focus. Okay. Um, he is there's some other guys, Aiden Fisher's really good. I, th- I think Jalen Walker is really underrated. He's a linebacker that I've seen Indiana move out to the boundary and pass coverage. I, I don't know how often teams have a linebacker athletic enough to trust him to do that. D'Angelo Pons is good. The safeties are good. But Kamara is the one. He had two and a half sacks and four and a half tackles for loss by himself in the Michigan State game. Like When he turns it on, he is pretty much the best pass rusher I think I've ever yeah. seen in Indiana. Um, he's really good. But I guess the question that I have, and I'm sure a lot of people have, is, is you know, Ohio State has recruited at such an incredibly high level, four- and five-star guys across the board. Indiana hasn't. I mean, the, their players are, are not highly – we're not highly ranked, generally speaking, uh, as recruits. Is there – could it just be that Ohio State just has the horses and Indiana doesn't? Or do you think that Indiana has proven by their performance this year that, no, the talent disparity is not not that great? I think, I mean, I think it's probably a, a, a bit of both. Like, I think that Indiana has shown that, you know, Signetti said something very early on in, in his time on the job. We were asking him about, especially about the portal. How do you recruit the portal? It was back in December. Obviously, the window was open then. And he said he prefers production to potential. And, and his point was, in a lot of cases, he's going to take a guy, even if it's a guy coming from the G5 or, you know, I mean, Elijah Surratt was at JMU last year. He was in. Uh, I think either FCS or division two the year before that, but guys that like have put it on film that have proven they can get on a college football field and produce and be relied on to play a lot of snaps and, and make a lot of plays rather than maybe, you know, something you see with programs like this region for a guy who maybe was a highly rated recruit just didn't quite work out at a place like Alabama or, or Georgia or wherever. I mean, Indiana has taken and Indiana has had success with some of those guys. And I'm not saying, Signetti will never take that player, but I think he he believes more in kind of when he goes into the portal, guys with experience and guys with proven production. And so I think there is an extent to which maybe Indiana is is kind of the example of how you come like how you basically combat what programs like Indiana have. And let's be fair, a lot of programs, not just programs like Indiana, have to combat, which is elite guys are going to still going to concentrate even in the NIL era in you know Ohio State, Alabama. Texas, maybe Southern Cal, Miami, Georgia, yada, yada, yada. Um, is Ohio State a, a, a deeper, more athletic, more talented roster than Indiana? A, almost certain. Like, I, you know, I, I mean, they might be all of those things more so than any other team in the country, not just Indiana or, or even any other team in the Big Ten. Um, but I think Indiana has shown that there are ways with smart scouting, smart development, um, you know, to, to, basically solve that problem a different way in an era when you can stay old, when you can go and get guys like I'm, I'm sort of amused at the people who say Indiana is going to regress as soon as Signetti loses all the JMU guys, as though those aren't all players that he recruited out of high school for the right. most part and signed and developed and then brought up a level. And it turned out they were still good enough to go from the Sun Belt to the big 10 and still produce. So um, it's probably a bit of both. And I think one of the, the things that goes, you know, that, that, that bends toward deciding how this game turns out is basically where exactly that point of inflection is yeah. between yeah. Ohio State still just being too talented and Indiana maybe being able through smart scouting and coaching development, et cetera, to, to mitigate some of that. Yeah, I think that's a, a good way of looking at it. I mean, I, you know, I think Ohio State's definitely more talented. Um, but look, uh, you can't just dismiss Indiana's results. I mean, you just can't. Um, uh, we probably should wrap this up. Um, I think it's safe to say this is the most anticipated Indiana Ohio State game in, in our lifetimes, for sure. Um, there have been some good ones, but you know, everyone knows 1988 is the last time Indiana beat Ohio State. Uh, they've come close a couple times, but um, this should be – I hope it's everything that people hope it, hope it is. 
I mean, it is undeniably the, the biggest regular season game in Indiana's history. This is the first time Indiana's played a game uh, ever when both teams have been ranked in the top five in the regular season. It's happened in, I think it happened in the 67 Rose Bowl, and I think that's the only other time it happened. Indiana's, you know, like one of our desk people did uh, did a piece looking at, you know, basically when, um, what are like the top five regular season games in IU history. You had the, the game against Purdue in 45 when they won their first Big Ten title the game against Purdue in 67 that got them into the Rose Bowl. After that, you know, it's 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 games that have some some symbolic meaning, like when Indiana makes the late field goal to beat Purdue the year after Terry Hepner passes away or the season after he passes away and and you know everything that emotionally that meant to the program. There was the I think I think they included the Ohio State game in 2020. Weird year, but a fun game and obviously important to the outcome of the Big 10 race that year. Um but I like, you know, the other one that I think was included was an 87 game against Michigan State where the winner went to the Rose Bowl and Indiana lost it. Like that's, you know, um, Indiana has never really been on this stage. Now I've been asked a lot of times, do I think the lights will get too bright for Indiana? I just, there have been moments when I wondered that myself, but I guess more than anything, I just feel like if they were going to, they would have by now. Um, That doesn't mean they're going to win Saturday. It just means I don't know if they're necessarily going to be overwhelmed Saturday. Um, the strength of this team is the strength of this coach, which is its ability to really just kind of compartmentalize and and just sort of laser focus in on what's next and literally nothing else. And they've had, you know, they've had now the bye week to prepare for it as well. So that probably makes them a little fresher, a little more rested. Um, and it, it, you know, it's it's it is almost certainly, I would say, the most fascinating game I've ever covered on this beat because I don't know exactly what's going to happen. Um I could see this game going a lot of different ways. There, there aren't many outcomes other than one team winning by 55, you know, that, that, that I would find kind of hard to believe. Um, but, you know, mostly just Indiana doesn't wind up in these positions very often. And, and like you said, if, if nothing else, it's, it's going to wind up being billed and it is being billed justifiably as one of the games of the year in the big 10. And I have a sneaking suspicion. It's going to play out that way, no matter who wins. Yeah. I think it'll be a competitive game. I'll be surprised if, if it's a blowout, if Ohio State blows them out, I'm more surprised if Indiana blows them out, but I'll be, I'll be surprised yeah. if Ohio State blows them out. Some people have likened this to the game against Michigan state 21 is the week before Michigan, Ohio state. I think Michigan state was number 10 at Kenneth Walker. Ohio State just blew the doors down. 56-7, I believe the scores, and, and Walker was hurt, yeah. didn't play much. And I don't think it's going to be like that. I mean, I, I, first of all, Michigan State was kind of a one-man team in certain ways that year, um, and Walker was hurt. But I just never thought that Michigan State was that good. Um, you know, I've watched Indiana enough to think that, yeah, they're legitimately good. Um, I don't know if they're at Ohio State's level. Uh, one given Saturday, you never know. I think it'd be different if the game were in Bloomington. I think that Ryan Day and Will Howard have already tried to get the fans riled up because you know the stadium, the horseshoe is not always. Uh, it's not Oregon. It's not. It's not Penn State. Um, a lot of times, and so I think they want the crowd juiced, and I think that could be a big factor. But again, we'll see. Again, Zach Osterman from the Indianapolis Star does a great job covering the Hoosiers. Usually basketball this time of year, but but now football. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for doing this, Zach. Appreciate it. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. Always good to talk to you. We'll see you this weekend. Sounds great. Thank you. Be sure and subscribe to the Buckeye Extra podcast in the iTunes Store, the Google Play Store, or on Stitcher.